that's all for now. Thanks again for joining us. Now let's continue with our series, The Games We Play. Monopoly is a classic game where the goal is to amass wealth and bankrupt opponents. It also provides a unique lens through which we can reflect on real life money management. Beyond its entertainment value, it serves as a catalyst for meaningful discussions about our financial values and behaviors. While the game's objective is to acquire properties and build fortunes, it's essential to consider the wisdom offered in the Bible regarding financial stewardship. Proverbs 21.20 underscores the importance of wise saving and resource management. 1 Timothy 6.10 warns us of the dangers of loving money. Luke 6.38 encourages us to give generously, promising blessings in return. God calls us to balance the pursuit of success with ethical considerations and a commitment to community well-being. The game's competitive nature can be an opportunity to reflect on and align our financial practices with the biblical values of fairness, generosity, and community care. Look beyond the game and its ties to human nature. Strive to understand how we can be faithful stewards of the resources entrusted to us by God. Watching online, let's just welcome one another this weekend. So glad you are here. I am in my second favorite game this weekend. Last weekend we tackled Risk. Today we're going to tackle Monopoly. But before I, I get into the message, I need to address uh, something that's pretty serious, and I need to just kind of house moment, so just hang with me. Um, there's some fake news um, that I need to address, and it's impacting my reputation. And uh, my wife's social media account uh, had this, <laughs> and so it's amazing what people can hack and get faked with AI, um, because, you know, you know me and cats, so I'll just go fake news. Uh, this, this would be more accurate uh, right here. Cosmo, he's cute. So uh, that, that, that should be the correct picture. So I just needed to clarify that because I knew that if some of you saw that, it would hinder your ability to receive from me, a man of God, and the word. So I just needed to get that out there. I, I love Jesus. Okay. So when we talk about money and managing money, just, just some of you, your blood pressure just went up. Like, you know, Monopoly, you go, oh, no, they're going to talk about money. Your blood pressure just went up. Because this is kind of a stressful subject for a lot of people. You know, like you think of things like taxes. Like, oh, my gosh, your blood pressure goes off the charts, you know, when you start thinking about the complexity of, of taxes. I was reading an article, though, some good news. The IRS has simplified next year's tax return. They just broke it down to two sections. So this is really encouraging. Uh, section one, how much money did you make? Section two, send it all in. So it... it <laughs> going to get simpler. So that was kind of encouraging. So uh, praise God. Now, you might be thinking, why is the church going to talk about the subject of money? And uh, I'm going to give you some biblical reasons why. The Bible talks about uh, prayer, about 500 verses on prayer. There's less than 500 verses on faith. But there are over 2,000 verses on finances and stewardship and possessions. So that means the Bible talked four times more about how you handle finances than it did prayer, how you, you know, the subject of faith than prayer. So it's a pretty spiritual subject inside of our life. When we look at Jesus, he taught 38 recorded parables. Of the 38, he used finances, 16 of the 38 different parables to communicate kingdom principles and spiritual truths. Statistics show that there are top two reasons people get divorced. Uh, one is uh, an argument over physical intimacy. Uh, the other is finances and the just struggle between finances. And so the Bible has a lot to say today. I want to get very practical for you in helping you with the subject of finances. Now, if you've been around the church for uh, multiple years, you know about every uh, year to two, I'm just going to get practical in the area of finances. And uh, here's what I found. This is the hardest subject to teach. Here's why. It never changes. It's the same. It, it's, it's simple. I, I was talking with Craig Rochelle uh, one time, and I said, what do you do when you get to the subject of money? Because you just feel like you're repeating yourself. He goes, I stopped teaching it, and I just hired Dave Ramsey to come in and teach our church on money. I go, well, that's good. You can afford Dave. I can't. So here I am, you get me. But I am better looking than Dave Ramsey. We have to agree on that, amen? And I have hair. All right, so 
there are some great principles that we can learn from the game of Monopoly that directly help us understand some biblical principles on how we can succeed with money. Now, unlike Monopoly, the way you win in Monopoly is you bankrupt your opponent and you're the last one standing. The great thing about the kingdom of God is for me to win, I don't have to have a loser. I don't have to beat you. You're not my competition. Your neighbors, you're not your competition. In the kingdom of God, God created all of us to succeed, all of us to win. And I believe that God wants all of us to achieve a certain level of financial freedom inside of our life. Now, it looks different for different people, but I do believe financial freedom is something that God wants for all of us. Again, different levels of that for different people according to what God's gifted you with. Number one, cash management. We have to understand how to manage cash. In the game of Monopoly, if you can't manage your cash, you run out of cash, game over. And there's a lot of things in your life that are over when you run out of cash. If you are a business owner, you know this, when you're out of cash, game over. So cash management is one of the most important principles, and the Bible talks about this quite a bit. We're going to read this Bible verse together, okay? Proverbs 21, verse 5. We're going to say this together out loud. The plants of the diligent lead to profit as surely as haste leads to poverty. We got two Ps. We got profit and we got poverty. Which one do you like? Profit. Who likes profit? Now, the Bible just summarized a lot of complexity down to two simple things. Those who live a hasty life, it will lead to lack. But those who slow down, take time, put a little discipline into building a plan, that plan will ultimately lead to profit. The people that I meet over and over and over who seem to struggle with finances, I'll go, hey, uh, tell me your vision for finances. And they get a blank look on their face. Vision? What do you mean, vision for finances? Well, and I'll say, well, tell me about your budget. Uh, you know, I've always been getting, wanting to get around to that. I just haven't had time. I've been really busy. Well, you just fulfilled the Bible. Because the Bible says those who are hasty, who don't have time, to create a plan are the ones who are always struggling with lack. That would be like saying, man, I keep running out of gas, but I don't have time to stop and fuel up. So there are times where if we just slow down and create a plan. Now, I just said an unholy word in God's house for many people, and that is the word budget. 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 Some of you are like, oh my gosh, don't defile my ears with such an unholy word. See, a lot of times people go, well, that doesn't sound very spiritual. Well, God's word's pretty spiritual. You can't get more spiritual than the word of God. And God said, a plan leads to profit. Now, a plan would just be another word for budget. A budget will lead to prosperity. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take a moment, just give you a couple practical nuggets on budget. We're not going to spend a lot of time on it. In fall, the fall, September, we're going to have a financial class, um, and you can have financial coaches, and we, we're going to go real, real practical in helping you. You can sign up for that. But I just want to plant some seeds. Now, I do know this. Right now, there is half of you that absolutely think I'm the greatest pastor in America. Half of you are like, this pastor is amazing. I love this guy. Oh, and your spouse hates my guts right now. Because opposites tend to attract, right? Because there, there is the spouse whose vision is the American economy. You think God's mission for your life is to support the American economy with every dollar that you make, that you think that's your God-given mission. Then your spouse is probably like, hey, can we talk about our spending? Can we talk about our budget? And so I'm doing marriage counseling right now. See, like one spouse is like, oh, this is so good. The other spouse has their phone out looking for a new church. Man, is there another church? No, you're not going to leave here. First of all, you ain't going to find something as good looking as this out there. (laughs) All right, just kidding. Now, here's some practical things on creating a budget. Sit down with your spouse. If you don't create a budget with your spouse together, uh, it's really hard to keep it because you need to do this together. So sit down with your spouse. Get out a sheet of paper or an Excel spreadsheet or, you know, whatever you're into. Uh, I'm just old school. I usually just get a sheet of paper. 
And at the top, write the word vision. The Bible says where there's no vision, people perish. People are perishing in their finances because they don't have a vision. Get a vision of where you want to be as you grow older. Get a vision of you growing old with your spouse, walking around the lake, taking hits off one another's oxygen tanks, and feeding squirrels. You, you need that vision. Isn't that right, guy rolls? That's what he does. And, and, and he just travels around, and him and his wife, and they had a vision, and now they're fulfilling that vision, feeding squirrels. And uh, so, but he had a vision, and he had a plan to get there. So you have a vision. Where do we want to be when we're 50? Where do we want to be when we're 60? Where do we want to be when we're 70? Get a vision. If you don't have a vision, here's what happens. Your money is getting hijacked by somebody else's vision. Because every department store, every credit card has a vision for your money. And not only do they have a vision, they got a written plan on how they're going to get it. And they got an army of employees after it. So if your vision isn't greater than their vision for your money, they will get it. So you need a plan. All right, second thing is create three columns. And just here's the title at the top of those three columns. Needs, wants, dreams. Need, want, dreams. Need, want, dreams. And you just write that. Now, as you're going through all your expenses, you're going to list it. Is this a need? Because what you'll start to find is many of the things that are sapping your discretionary income aren't in the needs category. They're in the wants category. And often they're in the dreams category. And it's not that you can't have your wants and dreams, but where you want to get to is that you're paying cash for your wants and your dreams. You're not mortgaging your future with the credit card at 27% interest compounded by the minute. Only the United States government can live beyond its means and get away with it. Only the government. The rest of us actually have to live within our means or it will catch us. So, needs. So, I'm going to break this down really practical. We need to eat, right? How many would agree on that? That is a need. Some of us need to eat a little less, uh, but it's a need. Now, at your house, there's a variety of things that might not cost a whole lot. I love Kraft macaroni and cheese. I just made a box the other day. This is a gift from heaven. Love craft. Now, it's gotten way, it used to be 50 cents a box. You remember that? Like four for a dollar, and now it's like 750 a box. Uh, but it still tastes good. I love it. But they keep shrinking the size of the noodles. Like, you can't even choke to death on it anymore. It's so small. I'm like, what the heck? Like, if I'm going to pay that kind of money, I, want, I should be able to choke to death on my own mac and cheese. But anyway, it's still delicious. Now, however you want to eat at home, statistics show it's typically cheaper to eat at home than eating out. All right. Now, you want to eat out. That is not a right, it's a want. So you want to eat out. Now, I love Panda Express. Who, who any Panda Express lovers out there? Yeah, I love Panda Express. Uh, just a newsflash. You know, you're like, oh, I want to go to China and eat Chinese food. It is nothing like Panda Express. <laughs> nothing like Panda Express. Good, but it is nothing like Panda Express. They don't even have Panda Express. And uh, so anyway... That, that's a want, not necessarily a need. And that's a lot more expensive than my macaroni and cheese. Now, we dream of a steak and lobster. We dream of a steak and lobster. Now, if you can go and you have in your budget and you have the discretionary cash for your panda or for your steak and lobster, great. But what you don't want to do is charge on a credit card what you don't have the money to pay for. Because that $100 steak and lobster on a 27% credit card is going to cost you a whole lot more than that $100. So what you're going to do is you're going to save the money, then you're going to reward yourself, and you're going to go out and pay cash. Now, if you're disciplined, you can put it on your credit card. I, I uh, use my credit card for like almost everything that I do because I get my reward dollars. But don't judge me, but I literally pay my card off every single day. Every single day. I pay off my credit card. I never roll over a balance to the next day, and every month I get reward points. But most people aren't that disciplined or nerdy as me. So if that's not you, don't do that. Pay cash. You want to be able to live within your budget. Now, we need housing, correct? How many go, we need a place to live? It's not fun to live in, the van, in a van down by the river. So you might start with 
Baltic Avenue. If you're a young new couple, don't look at the house your mom and dad have to go, that's where we start. No, that's their ending point, not their starting point. So start with something affordable, Baltic. My first house was $55,000. And it was owned by bikers who worked on their motorcycle in the living room. (laughs) There was oil everywhere, (laughs) but I got a great deal on it. It was Baltic, it was whatever was below Baltic Avenue. It was before Baltic Avenue, but you know what? I bought it, I put money into it, I fixed it up with my own sweat equity. (laughs) It was horrible, but it it was better than what I got. And then I sold it for about a $5,000 profit after all expenses in a year or so. So I was like, okay. Then you might go to Kentucky Avenue. This is your your, your nicer home. And I know we got somebody from Kentucky today. Where you at? (laughs) Hi. So, great. So, So I'm not gonna make fun of Kentucky today since you're here. (laughs) Kentucky. But we dream of boardwalk. You dream of the lakefront house with the jet skis and the pontoon boat. But if you can't afford that, if that is beyond your means, you need to start with what you can afford. Needs, wants, dreams. We're gonna say those statements together. Needs, wants, dreams. Need, wants, dreams. Feels good. Again, half of you hate me, but that's okay. Proverbs uh, 13, seven. One pretends to be rich, yet has nothing. Another pretends to be poor, yet has great wealth. In America, we got this illusion that you don't have to be rich, just look rich. But what's happening is people are mortgaging their future to look rich. There's a great book that I highly recommend. Uh, It's not a Christian book, but it'll help you understand money. It's called The Millionaire Next Door, and I think there's about 40 revisions to it. But The Millionaire Next Door uh, helps you understand that most rich people actually don't look rich, and they don't live rich lifestyles. They look like average, everyday people. Do you know the number one car a millionaire drives? It's not a Bentley. It's not a Ferrari. It's not a Porsche. It's a Toyota Camry. Now, the reason most millionaires are millionaires is because they don't live like millionaires, But the people who are trying to have a millionaire lifestyle and they're mortgaging their future to get it never get ahead because most of their discretionary money is just going to pay off interest to look rich. So like, there's nothing wrong with nice designer clothes if you can afford it, if you budget for it. My wife and I, we love outlets. We like nice things, we have nice taste, but we don't spend a lot of money. What we do is we kind of save up our money and then we go down here to the Chesterfield Valley and we go down to the outlet. My wife has coach, she has coach shoes, coach purses that she got for 70% off. Yeah, why? Because. We budget for it, we save for it, then we go buy it, and we got nice things, but it was within our budget. Here's a great saying that will change your life. Say no for a little while so you can say yes for the rest of your life. Say no for a little while so you can say yes for the rest of your life. One of the common denominators of all successful people in whatever field it is, whether they're an athlete, whether they're a business owner, great with finances, it's this. They can delay gratification for a greater result. They can say no right now to the compulsion, to the urge for a little while so they can enjoy something greater for the rest of their life. So when you're learning to live within your means, you're learning to live within your budget, and the word budget, listen to this, don't budge from it. Thus, budget. So when you learn to live within your means, you learn to say no for a little while. You're not saying no forever. You're just saying no for a little while so you can say yes for the rest of your life. You're welcome. That's so good. So good. The second part of winning the game is this. you got to collect assets. So in Monopoly, the way you win is by using good cash management to pick up properties because as you accumulate properties, what happens is your opponent lands on properties and they have to pay you rent. You've got a stream of income. Now, a great book that I've always recommended, in fact, I paid all my kids to read it. I paid them 20 bucks each. I said, you're gonna read it. And it was Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Now, I don't necessarily agree with everything that Robert says, but it helps you understand the difference between a consumer and an investor. A consumer and an investor. And so, 
if you consume all your finances, you have nothing that's generating extra streams of income for you. And so if you start to move to an investor mentality, you're going, where can I put some of this discretionary money so that it will make me more money? Now, I'm going to give 20 bucks away today to help you get started in your financial dreams. Anybody? You want 20 bucks? Great. Now, I'm going to give this to you, but what you're going to give me in exchange, because nothing's for free, you're going to give me a $100 bill. Where are you at? Where, where'd my people go? Peeps, where are you at? You're all like ready for 20 bucks. This is a deal of a lifetime. This is a once in an opportunity. This is even on sale. You give me 100, and I'm going to give you 20. Now, how many are you going, dude, that's crazy. I wouldn't do that. How many go, I wouldn't do that? How many go, that's a really bad decision? You do it all the time. All the time. You just don't see the 100 at the other end. If you take $20, you invest it at a 12% annualized rate of return, slightly more than the S&P 500. If you were to take this, in less than 15 years, you have this. Every time this comes into your hands and you go, I got to get rid of this. It's on fire. Woo. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Got rid of that. New record. What you're really squandering is this. Because you not only gave up the 20, you gave up the potential the seed had to generate this for you. Now, I'm going to take it a step further. I have six $100 bills. Now, these aren't mine. I had to borrow these from my wife because <laughs> I don't have this kind of money. This is hers, and she's watching here. She's making sure she's going to get this back. Uh, this was mine. This is hers. Now, how many would trade 20 for 600? You're going, absolutely not. You do it all the time. 20-year-olds, you do it all the time. You go down to Starbucks and buy your $20 Vente Frappuccino, and you're a little scone. And what you actually gave up is this. Because if you took this, you invested it at a 12% return. When you're 50, if you're 20, when you're 50, you got this. Stop looking at money as what it can do now. Start looking at what it can do for your future. got to get that back there. She's, she's eyeballing me. <laughs> this apple, I could eat about 80% of this. And if you start looking at your money as an apple, 80% of your income is to live on. 10% you go, I'm going to invest in the kingdom of God. It's called tithing. 10% I'm going to invest into my financial future. If you start learning to set aside for your financial future, you start thinking kingdom of God, you live on the 80%, here's what's going to happen. You're going to have more, ultimately, than if you ate all this. That's how money works. we got to start thinking the bigger picture with finances. Now, I'm going to show you this inside of Scripture uh, and it's this, Matthew chapter 25, uh, Jesus is giving uh, a story of three men that he gave a certain amount of money to, and we're going to pick up here, verse 14, for the kingdom of heaven, everybody say kingdom of heaven. <laughs> now, can you get more spiritual than the kingdom of heaven? Probably not. So this is the Lord saying, this is how heaven operates. This is how spirituality in his kingdom operates. Is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods. Everybody say his goods to them. And to one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, each according to what? His ability. And immediately he went on a journey. So have you ever in your prayer time told God you were available for more money if he was inclined to dish it out? God, I just want to let you know I, I'm available for Powerball. <laughs> I'm available for some rich relative I didn't know to die and to give me a bunch of money. I'm available if you just want to give me a whirlwind of cash. All of us have probably prayed the prayer of availability. But if you look at the root word of availability, it's able. Available is able. God may say, thank you for your availability, but what I don't see is ability. Because right now, this is the reality. You are where you are because you chose to be there. I know that kind of hurt. I'm sorry. 
Group hug, bring it in, bring it in. Group hug, love you, Jesus loves you. Healing bomb of Gilead, just bring it in. I know that kind of hurts. But we gotta start there to go, I am where I am because of choices that I made. Now here's the good news. If you are where you are because of choices you made, you can get where you wanna be with different choices to make. And that's what the Bible's giving us today. So the Lord is helping us understand money. John wrote this in 3 John. He goes, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospers. Our soul is our mind. Prosperity doesn't begin in a wallet. Prosperity begins with our mind. How we think, how we view finances. And God's changing our view of money. And he says this, it's mine. The reason we are inclined to mismanage money is because we think it's our money. But the moment we begin to understand nothing we have is ours, that everything we have is God's, it changes because now I'm not managing my money, I'm managing God's money, and one day I'm gonna give an account of how I did with his stuff. And what God is looking for, and we see in this story, is he's actually looking that we can take what he gives us and actually grow it into more. So to summarize the story, the guy who had five talents, he went out and invested it, and when the Lord returned, he said, hey, you know, here's, you gave me five, here's 10. And the Lord said, well done, good and faithful servant. Now here's what God does. He goes, you were faithful with little, I'm gonna let you be ruler over 10 cities. See, God looks at how we manage money, and Jesus said this, if you've not been faithful and unwealthy mammon, meaning money, how can we trust to you the true treasures of heaven? God looks at how we manage money to see if we can be given greater treasures in terms of eternity with him. So God's looking to see. See, the goal isn't to get to the end of your life and go, God, you gave me a million dollars over the life of my income, and, and I spent all million, got rid of all of it, plus I left a debt of 100000 behind. Woo! That's not what he's looking for. See, God's sending you seed into your hands every single paycheck, and what he's looking to see is can you take it and invest some of it so that you can grow it? The Bible says a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. But then not only that, that you can be an investor in his family business because God's looking for people that can rule and reign with him for eternity, and he really just looks at how we manage money as the greatest litmus test as to whether or not we can have greater management. So one man took the talent and he buried it. And so we pick up in Matthew 25, 8. Now this is gonna hurt some people's theology about life. But this is the words of Jesus. So don't send me hate mail. So take the talent from the guy who has 10 because he has too much and give it to the guy who only has one. Correct? Incorrect. But do we hear that philosophy in our world at times? We do. But it's not how the kingdom of God operates. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has 10. For everyone who has, more will be given. Why? Because they were able with what they had. And he will have abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. God is looking at this lifetime to see how we manage his stuff. And if we're good with his stuff, at the end, when we stand before God and give an account of our life at the Bema seat, the reward seat of Christ, he'll say, well done, good and faithful servant. Now I can give you things that truly matter. And that's the riches of the kingdom of heaven so that we can steward. Look at it this way. Picture a dad who has 120 acres of farmland. And he has three sons. And he's looking to see who he can leave the farm to and the family business to. And so to each of these three sons, he gives starting corn seeds. And he goes, I'm giving you starter seed, and I'm going to just see how you do. And so it's a test. He, the kids don't know it's a test, but he's testing them. So the first son, he goes out and plants. Now, he plants into two fields. So he has 40 acres to the left. 20 acres is for whatever he wants to do with his future. He sows into his finances, his 401k. He's, he's creating more harvest for his family's future. And dad said, you get to keep that. Now, on the right side, this is the family farm. This is the family business. And this is investing into the legacy of the family farm. 
Now, when the dad comes back and he sees that this son did great in both categories, dad's going to go, well done, good and faithful son. Now, we got another son. He went out and he did good on his own. He grew wealth. Great. But dad goes, what about the family farm? What about the family business? What about, you know, the the stance we have on the side of the road where we sell corn and the family legacy? And then we got a third son who had a popcorn party and had nothing. Now, when dad is working on his trust, (laughs) who does he want to leave the majority of the family inheritance to? The son who managed it well. Look, God loves all of us the same. There's nothing you'll ever do to earn the love of God. I love, I have three kids, I love them all the same. But if you're a parent, you understand this. Sometimes you like some more than others. I love you all. Just don't really like you right now. (laughs) It's true. God loves all of us. You didn't earn the love of God, and God doesn't love you because you're lovable. God loves you because he's love. But there are kids he looks at, and he keeps going, hey, (laughs) I keep trying to help you. I keep trying to bless you, and you keep having a popcorn party, and you pop all your seeds, and there's nothing left. I'm convinced the majority of our prayers are asking God for more stuff. Proverbs, uh, Philippians uh, 4.19, probably the most quoted Bible verse in prayer My God supplies all my needs according to his riches and glory. True. But is it possible that God knew you had a need before you did? Is it possible that God said, I know you're going to have a need in three months, so I'm going to start blessing you now so you can set aside for that rainy day when it comes. But what we do is we eat all our seed, and there's nothing left for tomorrow's need. This is so good. Like there's people that pay thousands of dollars to go to seminars to hear this stuff. And it's free because nobody wants to pay for it. 2 Corinthians 9.10. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply, increase the store of your seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. God wants you blessed so that you can be a blessing. And the better we are at managing our cash, setting aside for our financial future, and thinking about the family business called the kingdom of God. God wants you to be part of the family business. And what is that? Winning souls, plundering hell to populate heaven, sending missionaries around the world, sending the gospel around the world. And he's inviting us, this side of heaven, to be part of the family business. And God looks at his kids and says, you've been good at managing what I've been giving you. You've been good at saving for your future. You've been good at being generous. God says, I can trust you with more seed. And at the end of the day, this side of heaven, no matter how good you've been, at the game of money this side of heaven, here's here's what happens. When we die at the end of our life, it all goes back into the box. Every game of Monopoly that I've won, which is every game I've played, I just outlast people. Uh, At the end, it all goes back in there. The same thing in your life. My wife and I were working on our family trust uh, a couple weeks ago, and... I realize I'm, I'm listing, you're listing all your different assets and, you know, things like that. And I go, dang, our kids are going to be rich when we die because <laughs> I'm leaving it all to them. And they're going to eat some potato salad when we're dead and they're going to talk about how great we were and then they're going to go, woohoo! <laughs> it all goes back in the box. God says, don't just think about now, think about eternity. Because when we die, at the end of the day, somebody's going to get all our stuff. No matter how much stuff you have, somebody's going to get it. I, I, I've done a, a lot of funerals in 35 years of pastoring, and I've never been driving to the, you know, the, the, where they're burying people, watching the hearse, pull a U-Haul. Never seen it. Matthew six nineteen, Jesus says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth, rust destroy The corrupt cartel of the Federal Reserve can destroy with inflation. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. 
Since the uh, corrupt federal cartel was founded in 1914 by Woodrow Wilson, um, that's the central bank interest rate thing, uh, it, it's actually not federal, it's just private banks, uh, and our dollar has lost 97% of its value since 1914, and it's continuing to accelerate to pretty much zero. Why? Jesus said it. This side of heaven, moth, rust, inflation, it destroys. So Jesus says this. Some of it, be thinking about eternity. Some of it, be sending ahead of you. You can't take it with you, but you can send it ahead of you. How do you do that? The greatest treasure you'll ever have isn't stuff, isn't things, it's souls. It's lives that you helped bring to Jesus Christ through your generosity because when we get to heaven, I, I don't really think we're going to be like, oh, I got a cool mansion or, woo, streets of gold. I think it's going to be the people that we meet that came to Christ because we live generous lives. That's the true treasures of eternity. I knew it. Preachers are just always talking about money. They're trying to raise cash. This isn't about raising cash. In fact, when God talks about money, it's not to raise money. It's to raise his kids. Because the goal of Christianity is for all of us to look like Jesus, right? And for God so loved the world that he gave. You and I look like our heavenly father when we're generous. The person who wants to look like Jesus but who's never generous, you're going to have a really difficult time achieving that goal because Jesus is a giver all the way to the point where he laid down his life. I'll close with my favorite story uh, that my son provided for me when he was six. So I took him to Chuck E. Cheese for a day of father-son bonding. So we're at Chuck E. Cheese, and he saw in the store cotton candy, right? So, Dad, we gotta, we're going to play games. We're going to get tickets, and we can take those tickets, and we can get cotton candy. So we're playing games, and like $30, $40 in, he's got like 14 tickets. I go, this kid is horrible at skeet ball. <laughs> so we go up to the counter, and I go, yeah, we want that cotton candy. And the, and the lady goes, you don't have enough tickets. I go, like, I just dropped 40 bucks. He goes, I'm sorry, sir. Now, they did have something where you could buy tickets. So I'm like 50 bucks in now, and I got a dollar cotton candy. Like, son, we should have just walked up and bought it for 30 bucks versus your 50 bucks, because you can't game. So anyway, he's excited. So we walk out to the car. He, he opens up his cotton candy, and he's just working it. And so I sit down, and I reach into the back of the seat, put my hand in his cotton candy to grab a piece. He slapped my hand. My six-year-old son slapped my hand, pulled it away, and said, it's mine, get your own. Hang on. Let's rewind the tape. Whose 50 bucks was it for the cotton candy, mister? Now, He's 22, he's learned generosity. From time to time, he shares his cotton candy with me. What he didn't understand was, it was my money. I gave it to him. Not only that, I have so much money, I could buy enough cotton candy for his face to fall off. <laughs> he could lose every tooth and his face full of cotton candy. It's mine, my precious, my precious. See, every week when the offering comes by at church, it's mine. God, get your own. Or we realize it's his stuff anyway. God isn't needing your stuff. What God wants is your heart. And what God wants is to be able to go, I can bless you with more because you understand I'm your source. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Lord, all of us are probably in some pain right now somewhere from this message. We thank you that you're a healing God. We thank you that you aren't condemning any of us. We all fall short of your glory. We all fall short of your standards. And we thank you, Lord, that your mercies are new every morning. We thank you that Jesus paid the price for all of our shortcomings, for all of our sins. We thank you that right now you're not condemning anyone, that you're comforting, that you're enabling. And God, that you are sharing that the mercies of the Lord are new every morning. So, Lord, for anyone that's sitting here going, wow, I blew that, <laughs> I've messed up there, I thank you there's no condemnation in Christ Jesus. I thank you that today's a brand new day, that today's a fresh start, that they can just simply say, Lord, I'm sorry. I've mismanaged your stuff. 
I want to embrace what the Word of God teaches about good stewardship and that today's a fresh start and that they can take one day at a time, each step at a time, and that they can get from where they are to where you've called them to be. So Lord, thank you, Lord, for your mercy and grace today. I'm gonna ask just for a moment, every head bowed, maybe you don't know this Jesus. He gave you the greatest gift. It's not that God wants something from you, it's that God wants something for you. He wants to give you the free gift of eternal life. He wants a relationship with you. He wants to be your source that you can rely upon. In an unreliable world, he wants to be a reliable God. Today, he's simply a prayer away. He died on the cross for you, rose from the dead for you. The Bible says if we confess with our mouth, Jesus is Lord, believe in our heart, that God raised him from the dead will be saved. He's simply a prayer away. Maybe you've known Christ, but you've wandered, you've drifted your way. Today, you can come back home with this prayer. Love you, believe in you. We're all gonna join in. We're gonna say this prayer together out loud. There, St. Charles, Warrington, all join in online. Let's say this together. Jesus, thank you that you died for my sins. My greatest need isn't money. My greatest need is salvation. Thank you that you met that greatest need. Thank you that you rose from the dead to fill my empty heart. I confess you as my Savior and as my Lord. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Church, let's give them a big hand clap today. Amen. I'm so thankful for a church and a pastor that brings biblical principles.